You know how to book flights and hotels. All you're missing is a tool to plan the travel experiences you'll have once you arrive. That's why you need Viator. Book guided tours, excursions, and more in one place. There are over 300,000 travel experiences to choose from, so you can find something for everyone. And Viator offers free cancellation and 24-7 customer support for worry-free travel. Download the Viator app now and use code Viator10 for 10% off your first booking in the app. Find travel experiences for you. Do more with Viator. Swimsuit? Check. Sunscreen? Check. Phone charger? Check. Don't forget to pack the five hour energy. It fits great in a pocket or carry on, and the alert feeling will help you arrive ready for anything. Now get 20% off when you use code 5HE Travel at 5HourEnergy.com. Expires April 30th. One time use only, not valid with other discounts. Remember, visit 5HourEnergy.com and use code 5HE Travel to save 20%. We're rolling already? Right? We All rolling. right, great. Okay, welcome to Comedy Album Book Club. My name is Jason DeLine, your host as always, and with me as always in some way, shape, or form is my producer, Matt U. Ardell. How are you, Matt? Great, great. I was going to say Matt Ardell, and I know you often put Matthew, and this time I went Matt U. <laughs> it's six weird. of one half dozen of another anyway, so... I've never yeah. understood what that means. Okay, uh, so today uh, we uh, listened to the album Simply the Beth, a 2015 album by Beth Stelling. This follows her 2012 album Sweet Beth, which uh, got her some notoriety. She did Conan. Conan. That sounds like Regis <laughs> Philbin. Uh, she did the Conan O'Brien show in 2014. That was a sort of a big break for her. And she was uh, declared a comic to watch by a Comic Magazine in 2016. She's also been uh, a writer, performer, and producer on several Netflix shows. Uh, she's open for Sarah Silverman, Patton Oswalt. And I never heard of her until our featured guest today chose this uh, album. You're so, welcome. <laughs> and there she is. <laughs> uh, I probably wasn't supposed. To. I'm I'm doing that podcast thing of like I'm not supposed to talk until somebody says my name. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's great. This is very mysterious though, because n- we nobody Where knows who we're talking about. Well, actually, people listening to it would have probably read the liner notes. Grace Smith. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you name. Yeah, easy uh, to pronounce. Effect. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. You're from Halifax. Correct? Sure am. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, welcome. You Thank chose you. today's album, uh, mm-hmm. and you are. Part of the troupe, the, the sketch show, I should say, mm-hmm. called Generally Hospital. Yes, we uh, just finished up a run at Toronto Sketch Fest. Awesome. And yeah. it went well? It did. I'm very sleepy. <laughs> yes. uh, sketch Fest will do that, too. Yes, but it, it, yeah, it went well. Great audiences. And um, we got to try some fun new uh accessibility features on the show so right. uh, you were telling me that uh, you work in a community center and you yes. work in accessibility and inclusion inclusion yeah and some of that stuff has gotten into the show so yeah. tell us a bit about that well almost it, it, the other way around that i think from working oh. on this show people at my workplace heard i was uh working on stuff to do with accessibility and then like purloined me from my previous position into this into this job that I now do um but yeah we um uh, uh it's really important for us on the show to make it as accessible as possible so on this last run we uh had a relaxed performance and we mm. had an audio described performance but oh. a neat thing that we did uh for anyone who doesn't know what relaxed performances are they're just supposed to be for anyone with like sensitivity processing um and people can walk in and out and things people right? can walk in and out yeah. if you have a baby who you want like this show does have a lot of cuss words in it so you probably don't <laughs> want to bring your baby but you could and the baby could cry and you could just like walk your baby around in the aisle and it would be fine cool. um and but we really actually tried to the, there was one like official relaxed performance but we made all of the performances as relaxed as possible we're like wow. why should you have to sit very still in the theater yeah. at a comedy show when you're already making noise and laughing like get up walk around go get a drink use the bathroom come back and, and was it fine. was it different did that did the official relaxed performance did, did, is it is it was it madness is there people just running around or like what what is it like 
No, it wasn't any <laughs> different. I think we we underestimate how much people still have like the theater training in their head of like, mm. I know they said we could get up and walk around, but I don't believe them. Surely it's a trap. Yeah, I think uh, so. People still try very much to be quiet and but sit it, still. I think, but, but at least you're giving them the the permission. And and for some people, I think they stay out of environments like that for fear of even involuntarily something happens that they'll be ostracized or something. So they're at least welcome. Exactly. I think like a lot of people just don't go to see live performance at all because they're worried. Like if you have a bad back and you know, Mm. you can't sit for a full hour Mm -hmm. or like my dad has Tourette's. He doesn't go to a live performance a lot because he, he, if once he starts like uh, um, kind of moving around or, or saying something, people give him a dirty look because they, they don't know. So um, maybe where... now he'll come see my shows. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh finally. Come on, daddy. Yeah. Come support Grace. Come see my uh, high school music. Was that part of the uh, the impetus for this whole thing? Like you, you obviously have a personal stake in it. I, yeah, but in a, in a sort of roundabout way, I think mm. just from the first, when I heard about it, I, I wrote Lax Performance and just that a lot of comedy in the city isn't accessible. I thought, well, that's, that stinks. And yeah. Um, it, it just seems like, I don't know, I found getting into comedy such a rewarding experience for like finding my own voice and writing more. And I just the idea that some people wouldn't be able to access that right. uh, bummed me out. Um, and but then the more I got into it, the more I realized that I knew all these people in my life that would be able to benefit from that who I, I hadn't even thought of before. Like I Amazing. hadn't really thought that hard about my dad not being able to attend things. I was like, he just doesn't like musicals. That's why he's not coming to stuff. Most dads don't. That's true. Dads get into musicals. Well, that's great. Uh, That's very exciting, Grace. Uh, Very cool. And I'm glad the show went well. Mm -hmm. Uh, The show is made up of five people, including you, all from the Second City Conservatory. So you know it's good, high quality. And uh, we also have our second guest today, a gentleman who happened to be the dramaturge on Generally Hospital. Now, before we introduce him, Grace, I think you wanted to explain what dramaturge is. Oh, my God. This is the best day ever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, there's different schools of thought. Uh, in uh, Basically, in if you're in the UK, a dramaturge is sort of the person who does, like, extra research on a production. Not solely, but that's, like, the main thing they do. So they're the person mm. if, like, somebody references tuberculosis in the show, the dramaturge will run off do some, a bunch of research on that and then tell the cast and the actors will be like, right. great, thanks. Now we know what we're talking about. Right. But um, cool. in North America, it's um, I've heard it referred to as like a critic that got there in time. Like just <laughs> <laughs> somebody to be in the room and just who is very good at writing and story structure and um, piecing together a whole work who can listen and give feedback and... Uh, maybe not have as much of a subjective stake in the writing can kind of look at it from a bit of an objective place. Um, so, oh my God, I would never do a show without a dramaturge ever. They're so helpful. Wow. So this dramaturge for this show was our next guest, Ryan Hughes. Welcome, Ryan Hughes. Hello. hello. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. I, uh, um, I've also heard a dramaturge described like in film and television, in television terms, it would sort of be like a, like a story editor. Or okay. a script, script supervisor is a different thing. So it only uh, happens for original works, I guess, where you have that creative license. Well, well, the the way that the way that I do it when I do it is it, it's always in the sort of script development vein. It's never okay. in that sort of research vein because, come on. Um, <laughs> it, but yeah, like uh, you know, I have a lot of training and experience with like uh, making uh, theater and stuff huh. like that. So cool. Uh, I've done a lot of this stuff for like years and years and years. Um, I haven't been doing a lot of theater since I moved to Toronto, but uh, it's nice to to you know be able to apply it every now and then. How long you lived in Toronto? Uh, about eight years now. From where? From Edmonton. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Big theater town. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, it is. No, I know. Yeah. I laughed I did. nervously. I was laughing for the wrong reason. I was reason, laughing because Grace was laughing. <laughs> I was trying to support Grace as an inappropriate you. laughing. So, would it be fair to say you don't want to make the whole podcast about dramaturgy, even though I think Grace would probably be happy? Oh my dead. God, can we? Uh, would you? You wouldn't. Uh, you wouldn't have one, I assume, if you were putting on a Shakespearean play. I, you might have the the more like UK version where they're there to like research some of the context right. of the show what does nunnery mean yeah what isn't like <laughs> what's hamlet talking about yeah. uh but uh for, i think in the like the north american vein especially like in toronto though i don't have like 
I don't have experience doing theater in every city in Canada, but I know it's really popular for like playwrights to have a dramaturge they always work with. And that is always uh, there helping them develop their scripts. Like there's some that, oh, the, yeah, they have their favorite dramaturgs that they'll, they'll always right. work with. I imagine that's a much longer drawn out collaborative process than in television or film or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, yeah often very, uh, years. Yeah, and I, wow. I always wonder how they end up separating, like, who really wrote this? Because if you were both around for the development, guess who was ty- I guess who was typing on the computer? Yeah, it, it, yeah. Usually the typist, but if you hire a typist, then it might get uh, even more confusing. That's just whoever's closest to the monitor. Yeah, that's yes. when the guild has to step in. <laughs> that's why you have to film every process now for writing a play. Uh, yeah. So much footage you have Playwright to submit body to the camps. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to steal a best-selling joke that maybe we'll All get that. to talk about. Yes, that was it. that was a great joke. So yes, yeah, so today, today, uh, as we said, in case you forgot, it was a while ago. The album was simply the Beth by Beth Stelling. And you chose it, Grace. So tell us why you chose it. Oh, man. It was a very hard choice, actually. Um, I think anyone who's ever been asked, like, what's your favorite comedy album? What's your favorite movie? What's your favorite, like, song has suddenly been like, what's a song? (laughs) What is any comedy? So, but I thought, like, I have a little, I have, like, a Spotify list of every album that I tend to, comedy album I tend to re-listen to while I'm just, like, doing uh, grocery like unpacking groceries, doing dishes. You seem and like a very organized person. You've got a lot of structure in your I, life. Is that I that? have to. Yeah. Honestly, I'd be just all over the place if right. I didn't. I need to keep myself in line. Um, but yeah, and and uh, this Beth Stelling one is one that I've re-listened to a bunch of times. And so I felt, and, and also one that I've actually, after listening to, made a point to go see her live next time she was in town. And Which even, you've since done? Yes. Cool. Um. So there was other albums that I was thinking about, but I thought, um, what were this, this one, I was also thinking like, I, I really like Emily Heller's album. Um, good for her. Mm. Uh, and I really like, um, there's a couple, a couple like Cameron Esposito albums. I really like, I really like, uh, Rhea Butcher's album butcher. Mm. Um, but in terms of ones that I act albums, I actively quote in my day to day life albums where like jokes remind me of my family <laughs> and where I don't find where I find, I guess the least lulls. Cause you know, when you're listening to an album, you have your favorite con- sure, like yeah. bits that you'll kind of fast forward, fast forward. What am I <laughs> from the nineties? Um, but this one, I, I'll always, li- I'll always listen to it the whole way through. There's like so few clunkers in it. It's just like, yeah. so it, strong. It'd be a hard one for me to, I mean, cause we weren't looking track to track. We just sort of listened to the whole album without, without watching it that way, it would be hard for me to try to choose an entry point besides the beginning. Cause it just feels like someone just talking to you and it could change at any moment. I don't know how I'd be, I'm fascinated to know what her writing process is for this. Cause it feels like a stream of consciousness almost, but cause she doesn't stay on one topic for very long. Sometimes it's just a, a small bit, almost a one liner. And then she moves on to organize that and remember that must be, I know there's so like, I always think of this when I'm like halfway through it. I'm like, we ha- <laughs> uh, uh, we haven't even gotten to the mom sprint story yet. We haven't even <laughs> yeah, gotten yeah. to her uh, to her stepdad yet, and we're so many good bits into it. Like she really jam packs it with a lot, and she doesn't. I think I like about her is she doesn't let any bit overstay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel yeah. like she, she gets, gets in, she gets out. Yeah, it's, it's very economical. She's like a she's like a killer. Like she just gets yeah. in there, gets the best punchline, maybe a couple of uh, a couple of whatever. Uh, I can't remember stand up comedy terms. The jokes mm-hmm. after the jokes, like a, a callback or like a, a, a tag or tag. Uh, oh my right. god! Edit yeah. out my brain failing. <laughs> no, <Nope. laughs> uh, no, it's in. Well, then let the record show that I was clawing the air looking. It really for that I think they can feel it. The, yeah. the listeners can tell. The, yeah. uh, the thing that the thing that uh, it's deceptive, right? Because like she, her delivery is very. I'm gonna say this, and it's gonna sound like. I'm going like millennials, but it like it just she, she had like almost it made me think of Daria, you know the, the yeah. character. Yeah. Daria. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like it's just very flat and it's very yeah. casual, and it seems very lazy. But if you like listen to the way she uses language, like this stuff is meticulous. Yeah, yeah. Like it's meticulous. Yeah, her use of language is just. She doesn't throw like the tone of her voice almost sounds like she's throwing away lines, but they're yeah. they're always very precise and also 
you're so right about the Daria thing, and now I understand why I love her so much. Because I was a big <laughs> well, Daria there's fan. Some, something sincere about that not trying too hard, right? Like we're we're mm-hmm. past that point in comedy where it's uh, a presenter or or the expert in the room who's wearing a suit and smarter than everybody and here's the joke and here's the closer part, you know like here's the setup here's the punchline and uh yeah she she doesn't have that <laughs> I, I don't want to say effort behind it but it, it's not like she's she doesn't feel like she's trying to entertain it feels like she's just telling the truth and this this stuff happens to be funny the way she happens to orate uh, she's just good with words and it it feels very accessible it it feels like just a regular person and who's really great at storytelling as opposed to a storyteller, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If the word or the term I kept thinking of was like a relaxed swagger. Yeah. Oh, where yeah. it's yeah. so, it, it's like, it's laid back. It's not trying too hard, but it's so confident. Yeah. Without having to prove anything to anybody. Yeah. There's something like one thing I wanted to point out, especially listening back to this um, and she makes some jokes about being called a female comedian so often. But mm-hmm. there's um, there's a certain amount of confidence and, and she does self-deprecating humor, but there's a refusal to really rip on herself. And mm. she maintains a sort of swagger and self-confidence that I find yeah. so appealing. Like she, like one of her early tags, she has that amazing, amazing joke about how she's uh, gained and lost weight so many times her boobs are like... Uh, an atheist dad, yeah. a Catholic mass, yeah. they're not getting up again. But then her, her tag is, I'm kidding, they're amazing. And that's yeah. just so confident that she's, that her tag is, is complimenting herself again. Yeah. Right. And that I feel like isn't, I feel like that's something that, um, that audience just don't always let female comedians get away with that kind of complimenting right. yourself. Yeah. yeah. That she's like, does so much. And I just, love it a lot that she does the tag is never insulting herself right and i and i think that goes is sort of opposite to be be opposite to what is the trend these days and that i think a lot of comedians are very self-deprecating uh you know even if the stories aren't true i mean you know a lot of comedians will just make something up for the sake of a joke but Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of this stuff feels very true Mm -hmm. and her side of it and it's clear that a lot of the stuff she went through was painful or she didn't make great choices but Mm -hmm. yes still sure of who she is and that's cool like she doesn't like yeah this happened so i'm an idiot you know and we we Mm -hmm. see that and it seems easy but she she's better than that i guess yeah and, and that's what and i don't want to obviously some people do like that kind of woe is me self-deprecating sure. and it's amazing yeah but i do feel like that's i also feel like that's kind of what's like taught with stand-up comedy is mm. that is to always go for the self-deprecating thing like i took and i i took a stand-up class at second city i'm by no means a stand-up comedian and i'm not <laughs> saying <laughs> claiming i am but i i had a joke that was like probably after listening to this that was also like the tag was complimenting myself was like Mm. it sounded like it was going to go self-deprecating and instead it was like a real big compliment and that was uh uh, the joke and the the teacher was like no like people aren't gonna like that you have you have to end on ripping on yourself and i was like why why? i mean i i get that that's the general rule is yeah you want you don't want to seem too above the audience but if you want to emulate a specific style what's the point it has to be true to who you are and what you want to say and also there's just i don't know i i feel like it's also about finding what you kind of and your vibe can get away with like she just gets sure yeah she she man like she just manages to pull off that like I'm, I'm kind of great, sort of. Yeah, vibe. but in a very non-threatening, non-confrontational way, and I think that's maybe that style is what people have a problem with. If someone's too in your face, maybe they have a problem with it. We're like, I'm the best. I'm amazing. You're like, whoa, get out of my face. You're a jerk. You're full of yourself. But like, if it's like, yeah, I'm pretty great. <laughs> like, you know, like, all right, I'm not threatened by this. That's fine. Interestingly, like she works on uh, with Natasha Legero who has that bravado of I'm so awesome. Everybody kind of sucks compared to me. Mm-hmm. And it's in a way it's a revert because the truth behind the joke is kind of more self deprecating than not. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. it on the surface scan of her material is that bravado and sh- like strutting around the stage. And I'm so awesome. And 
they both work super dark, but they both have very opposite styles in a way. And it kind of, and like watching that kind of comes through in their collaborations. So it's like, it's one of those people who I think she just works really well with other people. And she, she's, I, I think Beth Stalling is able to sort of adapt her material because of that casualness. Like she's, she just listens to the to the room, gets the feel of it, and just plays to the strengths of the material. That's a yeah, I I love that that uh, connection between the two of them. Yeah, there is something, even though they're not, you wouldn't put them on a bill next to each other and be like they're the exact same, but like they both have that, um, like n- not the current trend of sort of anxiety comedy, no. and nothing against mm. anxiety comedy. I love anxiety mm-hmm. comedy, yeah. but like they're both not playing off of oh look at me, I'm such a mess. Right. They're both like, I'm kind of great. And like, you know it and I know it and I have some flaws. And here's sometimes I've made like, here are funny stories about me messing things up. But like at the end of the day, I'm pretty great. And I just love that. <laughs> she's very, she's very good at scenes too. Mm-hmm. Like, like sort of creating scenes in her stand up. Like, yeah. um, you know, I, I'm trying to think like the, when, when her mother went to buy a Playboy because she mentioned in it, <laughs> yeah, and it just the 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 beautiful sort of double meaning of the, you know, putting her mother at the counter buying the Playboy and yeah. oh mm-hmm. oh it's not what it looks like my daughter's in here, <laughs> you know, yeah, and yeah. just the the multiple different things that ends yeah. up meaning in that context is like yeah. it's it, like very good sort of comedy scene writing yeah mm-hmm. even in the shorter bits like the 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 indoors garage sale. Yeah, like oh, yeah. she sets a scene in like a minute and a half of a joke, like minute and a half, two minute joke. Mm-hmm. You can like she just lays it out to the point you can picture in her in your head exactly what she's describing. But also in a way that it wouldn't be done if it was filmed. Yeah. She's very economical, and when she mm-hmm. decides to give the characters in her stories dialogue, it's only when it's absolutely necessary. So we're not hearing this huge conversation of then he said, she said. Like we we never heard the voice of the person she bought the Playboy magazine from yeah. in the store because it wasn't mom. necessary. Mm-hmm. We just needed to hear the stuff the mom said. And yeah, that's you have to have you know a, a, <laughs> a clever enough mind to be able to tell a story economically. Well, this is why this is why I feel like the 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 sort of the casual delivery. I think it's very genuine. I think that's probably who she is. But sure. like, you know, I, I, I just to me, I'm just sort of like, there's so much writing going on here. Yeah. Like yeah. there's mm. so much, like so much of this is built. But the best, you know? the best of that stuff is always when you can't see the, yeah, exactly. right. Exactly. The inner you know, workings of it. You can't see the matrix behind it. It's, it doesn't feel like writing by numbers. Yeah, yeah. And also I think like when, when you've listened to it so many times, which I have <laughs> at this point, you really notice how in control she is of that sort of laconic uh-huh. uh, mm-hmm. delivery that she can, she, again, you would think for somebody who just like naturally talks like that again, that they would sort of be throwing away jokes, but she really slows it down mm-hmm. when the joke calls for it or the scene calls for yeah. it. Like those scenes, um, dialogue scenes, she takes so slowly, leaves real beats in between yeah. lines of dialogue and really, is in control of the pacing of those scenes. And whenever she's so her well. mom, oh that goes God. away. It's yeah. gone. Oh, yeah. 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 Can we different all just talk entirely. about her mom for oh. a second? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think she's got kind of another one of the great comedy moms. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. And not... Just blessed. Like, recognizable, but not the same comedy mom that everyone no, has. No, yeah, it's like her I'm, own. It's, yeah. not, it's not Maria Bamford's mom. It's no. not Margaret Cho's mom, but it's mm-hmm. like... It's got that iconic quality to it. Sweet yeah. and innocent. And yeah. that's, yeah, I yeah. think that's what it is, is just this completely, like she calls her mom a virgin. Yeah, I like, think yeah. just the line like, of, yeah, yeah. Um, my mom's a virgin is right, that's just great. like, that's all you need to know about. Just this yeah. kind of yeah. like really wide eyed, sweet lady in like a dark, horrible world. <laughs> right. And she doesn't know it. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, it, before we get to her mom, she's already uh, built how dark this world is we're playing in that that her standup is built inside. And then, Oh yeah. And here's my mom plunked into all this garbage and how she deals with it. And just the idea of that uh, is funny Mm -hmm. context. Well, Mm -hmm. I think like I I was thinking after we listened to the album, while I was peeing, I was thinking (laughs) how well structured the album is as a whole. Cause it feels, Mm -hmm. I think at first listen, almost like, okay, we're going to put all the sort of shorter bits up front Mm-hmm. And then we're going to get to some like stories in the latter half, which is not an un, un, like an atypical way of 
right. organizing an album. But yeah, when you really think about how she builds this sort of world that she operates in with like all these terrifying children saying terrifying <laughs> things. Yeah. And um, she sets up all these situations where people just have like really kind of terrible reactions to her. Like the kids who say awful things that all the people who like the, the, the guy who reacts to her weight loss by saying oh, your tits got small, like yeah. that everyone's just kind of being awful and saying awful things. And, and that she doesn't introduce her mom to like halfway exactly, through. Yeah. Yeah. She's is, built this world that everyone's the worst. And then, Oh no, her poor mom has to be <laughs> in this place. Her mom seems so nice. Women need body cams for their relationships. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I think, like, I, I mean, again, I don't want to bring down the room, but it, it's, it would be also impossible to talk about this album without referring to the fact that, um, you know, Beth Stelling was also kind of gained notoriety for coming out about her, her abusive partner. Yeah. yeah. And that the, um, I think it has been confirmed in interviews that the relationship she's talking about in this one is that I relationship yeah. right. about the one where she, uh, like, she, um, starts dating him while all the ex-girlfriend stuff is still in the apartment. Right. And, and man does that line um, about like, I know everything about her. I know what shampoo she uses. I know what clo- size clothes she wears. And all she knows is why I should dump this guy yeah. um, really takes on quite a, um, a different meaning when you know, sort of the, the artist biography. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But it was incredible how she kept so much of that. So light though. Mm-hmm. You know, so mm-hmm. accessible. I mean, there's a lot, there's darkness in it. And especially if you can read between the lines, but uh, still very accessible. And, you know, when you're talking about how she has different lengths of stories and different bits and she changes with the pacing, it's still amazing that, and, and a lot of comedians can't seem to be able to do this. You never go very long without laughing. Like she peppers the whole journey with jokes, not just the punchlines mm-hmm. of, of the stories, but just little asides all the way through. And that's, I really appreciate that. I mean, you know, I'm a fan of Mike Birbiglia too, and he can tell a a long, you know, 10 minute story that then just has a beautiful laugh slash cry at the end. But I also appreciate someone like, uh, like this who can just laugh, 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 laugh. It's like an effortless or seemingly effortless. I'm sure it is very like took a lot of work, Yeah, but like how just little jam packed with little, jokes it is and you can mm-hmm. hear like from the audience in the room some land obviously better than others as sure. they tend to but like that she moves through them so quickly and right. with such confidence that it just feels like this tapestry of jokes yeah that's interesting uh i feel like she convinced me whether it did or not that everything worked yeah. <laughs> you know just the way she reacted after every joke she's a really good recoverer yeah like she, it's yeah. i always like a comedian that's like where a joke doesn't like a joke goes a little haywire or it doesn't it scares people instead of right. makes them laugh uh, and i always admire the people that can just kind of go like all right well uh, i'm now making this a part of it and like she does yeah. that a couple of times in this yeah movie. she's like yeah. oh that joke's usually for one person and it was that lady right there which yeah. which <laughs> joke was that i can't remember oh it was, it was uh, the, the 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 losing a child joke oh, yeah. oh my god which is, oh, yeah. yeah that was dark i i like <laughs> often forget how dark this album is till I'm listening to it with other people. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, I kind of like to me again that joke is 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 uh, more about this weird thing this kid said to yes. her about kinda your like either language thing. Yeah, yeah, but then yeah, when you think about it like oh this is also a joke about losing a kid and the implications of that and yeah, the recovery is so good that she's just like Yeah. 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 And just, just, just with her voice, she and the, the her, her cadence and the way she carries all the material if you look at it on paper it's super super dark but oh, when you yeah. hear it it just it, there's a buoyancy to it that mm-hmm. doesn't feel artificial it doesn't feel no. like a force but it's just like just this natural way of delivery where it's like as dark as it gets it just sort of like brings you along for this ride and that's that sort of millennial slacker sort of attitude where it reminds me there was a simpsons episode where um marge said to lisa something like isn't this amazing and lisa says we're from the generation that doesn't experience highs or lows. She says, oh, what's it like? <laughs> Meh. And, you know, the younger people, it seems that they sort of live this life of mediocrity where they're not affected one way or the other. I mean, yeah, they are, of course, but they, they don't seem like they are. And this sort of seems like that. It's just like, yeah, I got an ice cream cone yesterday. Yeah, this kid died. Like, it's all sort of in the same... You're affected the same way. It's interesting to hear it that way. Because then... 
you don't get as darkly affected as if someone else was telling this joke and you can stay in the same sort of lightness throughout. You don't get bummed out or, you know, and you can, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. I, I do feel like, um, I feel like, uh, I think the darkness sort of works for her a bit more because it, it it's, I'm trying to figure out how to put this. I, I kind of feel like sometimes with darkness, when comedians sort of work dark, Mm-hmm. Sometimes it really feels like they're just sort of, they're trying to, they're trying to push a, a like a big reaction or a big, like mm. they, they're going for the dark effect. Right. Whereas sure. I, you know, I, it, this feels really honest and this feels really just sort of like, this is, you know, this is where I live. Right. You know, like and some of it is, feels shocking, but it doesn't feel like that was that's what she goal. was going for. Yeah. yeah. Just like, and some comedians, that's it. It's it's just like, oh my God, I can't believe they said that. And they're like, yeah, I said it. And then they move on. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this isn't that. It's shocking, but it's it's better than the shock. The, yeah. the material yeah, is better. Yeah, there's, I'm, I've been trying to put my finger on, on exactly what allows her, I, I'm saying allows her to get away with it. Like, it's obviously up to individual audience members sure, that she gets away. Sure. But like, for example, a, there are jokes in this, only two, I think, that if I were, let's say, her friend who she asked for editing advice, I was like, <laughs> hey, should I edit anything out of this? There's maybe two that I would get Which rid one? of. I would get rid of maybe the um, the end of the plane joke where she 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 body checks the uh, flight attendant uh, and makes a joke about how, like, so when he bangs me in the knee with his drink cart later, we'll be even, which is a funny joke and I love. Mm-hmm. But then she makes a joke about how when she wakes up later, her bra strap is loose and her right butt cheek hurts and right. implies that he got back at her through some sort of sexual assault. Yes. Which, on one hand, yeah, if I was editing this album, I might be like, I think it's funnier if you end on the drink cart thing. But also, I can see me hearing that coming from other comedians and maybe them losing me. And somehow Mm. she doesn't lose me on it. Mm. It's not my favorite joke. Right. But also I like somehow I also don't like it. It's not a detraction. And I don't know how she gets, I think cause she just moves on so quickly to a silly like IUD joke. Yeah. Cause (laughs) I remember, yeah. When that, when she said that joke, I feel like it took me a second to process it. And before I could be outraged, she moved on to the next thing. I was like, wait, did she just say what I think she said? Mm-hmm. And like, before I could get really worried about it or yeah. get like brought down at all, she, yeah, into something silly right right away yeah. after. What's the other joke? Um, oh, I think like, and this one isn't even, I don't know, I, I, I debate this one back and forth. She starts off with some, with some weight loss jokes. Mm. And I'm just generally not one for the like weight loss as an easy topic. Sure for humor and, and as like a, a, like always seen as like weight loss is inherently positive. Blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, I don't know why I said, blah, 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 blah. I agree with my own opinion, um, <laughs> but that, I mean, even that I also don't mind because I think most of the jokes end up with like the joke is on other people for not reacting to her weight loss properly. Right. Rather yeah. than mo- on like, it doesn't really shame her. Yeah. Yeah, it's you know it, it uh, for, for for those listening at home. Uh, I'm or I'm, anywhere you don't want to listen to this at home. For those who don't know what we look for those, like, for those <laughs> for those uh, in whose ears we are currently residing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm a I'm a larger fella. Um, sometimes that uh, fat jokes, for lack of a better. I mean, I don't really feel like what she's doing is a fat joke, but yeah. um, uh, make me uncomfortable. Uh, mm-hmm. Talk about weight loss can make me uncomfortable just because it can so easily slide into meanness yeah Uh, even even if the person telling the joke is also a larger person they're being mean to themselves or whatever i don't feel like that's what she was doing Mm -hmm. i kind of feel like again she was just sort of talking about a thing that happened to her right and that's how it happened and the side effects of that and she's talking about it yeah like so you know it it made me personally a little like oh i always feel self-conscious listening to this stuff Hmm. but i don't feel the issue was like with the joke i think that that was just my shit you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, let's talk about that, Brian. <laughs> How does that make? Oh, um, but I mean, I think, and that's why, because it's like sure. for it to open the album, and you kind of like, if you're listening and you don't already know what her vibe is, I can yeah. see being a little like, oh, I don't trust yet that she's going somewhere like smart. 
Yeah, with it, the, it, it with took me a little while stuff. to warm up and, and feel not safe, but just yeah. to get what she was doing. Yeah. yeah. Safe in her womb of comedy. Safe. <laughs> um, but also, um, one other... That is me jokes so great. And that was the thing. Is I, 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 to this, I, there's, uh, that's a thing I love about a joke like that, where I'm just like, that's such a good joke, and now I really need to know if her mom really had a hysterectomy. <laughs> right. Or yeah. if it was just a oh setup God. for the joke. <laughs> you know? Uh, that, that's the thing, listening to her material, like, the stuff that the kids sa- said, and, like, the history, I, I, it all feels, like, real. Yeah, and, and as opposed to something she's inflating for, the, she never goes to that place of, oh, this is like you know heightening to get the get the laugh. This yeah. is all it's always at a level which is like, oh, this yeah, this could be real. Like I've had kids say some really weird <laughs> stuff to me, like yeah. their dead boyfriend who lives in the backyard and visits them every night. I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah, what was it when the kid went down for nap time, just like, I gotta rest my, my weary, weary bones. bones. <laughs> like, yeah, that's, that's not crazy, but it's, it's still weird. It's, it's real It's a weird that, thing yeah. for an eight-year-old. There's yeah. something, yeah. I actually, I, believe it. I feel like she's so good at the grotesque. Like yeah. at yeah. voicing yeah. characters who are who just like your only reaction can be like, Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> and which is a, a sound she makes a lot. But yeah. like that ex stepdad and like exactly there's, there's something about these characters. Abe Lincoln, Ginger Crane, Fire Fire Right, right. Yeah. Where when you when the next line is just her grimacing at them, you get it. You're like, yes, that person is terrible or that kid is weird like yeah she i think she has um again for somebody so sort of laconic sound and uh monotone sounding sometimes she has such great vocal acting mm-hmm. for these grotesque characters yeah and that's a nice it's a really nice contrast between how she talks right because mm-hmm. she it feels like she almost puts a little more energy into those characters and you can really hear yeah. the so they really the pop change. when yeah. they, like the sprint guy in the story with her mom just like yeah just like a bridge troll. Just like yeah. yeah having like a <laughs> 200 dollars like he just sounds like he is a troll like yeah. like you don't know that but he is yeah and i i think there's something like um <laughs> one bit that i don't think would work if another comedian did it is her bit about um using her hair as her wedding veil <laughs> yeah. because it's kind of nothing like it's yeah. just like you know um a thing they tell you um in in comedy writing a uh, sketch writing especially is um don't do the wouldn't it be funny if do isn't it funny that like you should observe something about the world rather than being like wouldn't it be funny and weird if this weird thing sure. happened right. mm-hmm. and that's a quintessential wouldn't it be funny if i use my hair as my veil like it's not an yeah. observation about anything and yet because she has such a talent for the grotesque and for painting a picture of a grotesque situation, it's somehow so funny her dad's reaction to her doing yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. In a <laughs> hypothetical situation that never happened, just her dad going, what the fuck? Well, then I love that <laughs> instead of it, it, it for a second, it feels like the poor father has a weird daughter, but then he says, what the fuck? This is my fault. And she goes, and it is. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic and, yeah. to keep him responsible for that. Yeah. And it suddenly becomes a joke, like a joke on her dad. Yeah. yeah. What a great spin on that. Yeah. I don't know if anyone's, this is uh, veering off this album a lot, but she has material and some of her other stuff about her dad and what a weirdo oh, yeah? he is. Mm-hmm. I highly recommend looking it up if you haven't. Like he. Have you, uh, uh, Matthew, have you heard it before? I have. That's on Sweet Yeah, Yeah. I think it may be. Um, Or it might just be on, like, um, because she's done uh, little, like, specials and stuff. Yes, TV specials and stuff like that. Okay. Um, But just the, she has such a good talent for these, like, bizarre, bizarre characters. Like, her dad, who apparently, like, he, I think he lives in L.A. and, like, dresses up. In, as costume characters for a living. Yeah. And then her mom. He works the LA strip. <laughs> yes, he does. that's it. Yeah. And he like feeds raccoons out of in his backyard or something oh, wow. like that. And huh. then and then you so you only get a little taste of him in this album. It but is that's his enough. fault. It is his fault. <laughs> oh. Um but I I also just love the mom and and dad stuff cuz like I grew up in a pretty like uh low income house so the joke about um like, how did your mom raise you alone? <laughs> it really yeah. hits home for me. Like, like I was, my mom didn't raise me alone, but we, we were raised in a house where burping was like the, 
the best thing you can do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where burping the alphabet without throwing up was like, <laughs> you got extra dessert for that. <laughs> so, okay. We gotta, Instead of cable. We got to slow this down for a second here. How many people in your house threw up while trying to bar- burp the alphabet? My Mostly my sister. <laughs> I think she, um, she had a story about how she was, I forget if she was practicing burping the alphabet or was just burping a lot. And she was in the shower and she just threw up in the shower, kind of used her feet to push it all towards the drain and kept showering. And my family was like, it's very logical. That's the place place to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas me and my mom were very talented burp artists. Um, We can we can do it. We know when to stop. Right. So that we do not. So it came real natural to you. What you're saying is that she really worked at it. Yeah, my sister was trying (laughs) to do (laughs) real. Is that something you would want to pass down if you had children? You'd want them to be good at burping, yeah? I feel like it's such an uh, underappreciated talent. Or at least shower to be able to. (laughs) At least shower. No, my sister passed that on to her kids. What's a what defines a good burp or good burp artist? What, what um, are the skills Being able involved? to do it on command. On command? On command. Let's, sure. let's hear one. Let's see one. Okay, not bad. They're, and like, you know, they don't have to be like the loudest every time, but being able to consistently do it. That was a smaller one. Sorry. So, so I also a, did just have a lot of pizza, so I am scared. There's an all. honor in your family <laughs> about being able to control some uh, part of your digestive system. That, that was, uh, a, that was scary. Yeah. It's my, <laughs> like, that's why even like there, she has that joke about like, feeling the most like uh like a mother when she's really gassy which isn't the strongest joke on the album but even sure. then i kind of feel like a kinship to it because i have the gassiest family <laughs> in the world <laughs> i remember like tangent but when my dad would like when i was in middle school and we started having like school dances and um, we lived pretty close to the school so rather than my dad driving me he would just walk me to the dance and he oh. would fart the whole way there <laughs> and when we got within like so many feet of school i was like dad you have to stop like the, uh-huh. other, the kids are gonna hear you farting and he's like and he's like okay let's just stand here for a second let me get them all out oh, wow. uh, now we can continue uh-huh. towards the school wow so there was a finite number <laughs> <laughs> well, so like, is it like with every step like it was like fart, a little fart, steam fart. Propell- <laughs> propulsion <laughs> machine <laughs> i'm not convinced he has like muscles it might all be farts. You think that? So I wonder if there are some winners of uh, marathons, etc., who are gassier than others who it's might use the that. New, um, it's uh, the new steroids. It's the new, like, they just have like a burrito. Oh god! <laughs> um, but uh, uh, there are a couple like phenomenon that she defines in this album that I also just find useful for life. Like you know how there's like. Like everyone has a few Simpson lines that mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. you just call upon because they they sum up a situation sure. so perfectly. Like and and she has a few of those that I find myself like using a lot in life. Like the um, being a Tarzan dater. Oh yeah, is is a type of like that's a that's a dating pattern for sure. They're like. You don't let go of one dick until you're reaching for the next one. We all know those people. Yeah. Well, and I just love how far she took that because that's a great joke. And then like one of the tags she has on that is like, I'm college educated. I'm not, I'm not letting go of my old job until I have a new one. Yeah. <laughs> but um, and it's such a it's just such a useful term. Like now when I see those people who and I, I used to be one for sure, where I would like you don't quite you sort of hold on to the old relationship until you're like sure that you've got another thing <laughs> coming down the road. And then you're like, yeah. okay, phew, I feel confident. Uh, um, like it's, it's such a useful term for that. Mm. And um, <laughs> what's the, um, I feel like I wrote down other ones. Um, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> um, that, that's the only one I can remember off the top of my head, but okay. I feel like there's a couple others where that are just like, um, yeah, phenomenon that yeah, I can't remember. Well, she we'll reminded me a couple times of someone like uh, Stephen Wright or Mitch Hedberg. Like, I know she doesn't do a lot of the what if or did you ever notice even, but just sometimes just a really quick in and out, almost a one liner. And mm-hmm. uh, that's mm-hmm. an easy enough thing to take away with you. It sums up the whole story, the whole bit yeah. in, in one or two lines. There's like several tracks that are like one minute, one minute 15, one yeah. minute 30. Like they're they're not she doesn't waste 
any time, but it feels like a like if a joke was a sandwich, you got like a really good juicy Reuben out of every one of those jokes. Yeah. And there's no extra ingredients that you didn't need. Yeah. Oh, yeah. the yeah. the other one that I found like was a good a thing I just referred to a lot in life is her bit about getting the um her boyfriend's name tattooed on her back or tattooed. As she says, yeah, I noticed which, that too. Dude. Yeah, um, gets stuck in your brain. But uh, <laughs> and then she has that line about, "Do you know how hard it is uh, to get a guy <laughs> and to get laid when you have another man's <laughs> name tattooed on your back? Not yeah, hard. Not, not, not hard. Yeah. It's so it so perfectly uh, sums up um, how dating and getting laid is different for men and women. And the, yeah, and that and that bit could have ended. At, uh, at various points, but she kept tagging on one more little yeah. sentence that just made it funnier. Like, this is the kind of commitment you can expect from me. Would yeah, be that's a perfect so great. End to that. Looking back at him <laughs> to say this, like you have this visual. <laughs> well, and it's and that's just another great bit of her of of writing where it's like, mm-hmm. I, like she's really good at sort of constructing those sort of situations where something that somebody says means to like. It, it, comes in different directions because yeah because that could mean a, a great deal of commitment uh, right. because like i've got a name tattoo there yeah or not a huge deal of commitment <laughs> right because it's a... someone else's name and yeah. you're fucking exactly. me yeah. you know? and exactly. it's another great example of her confidence level where yeah. it like the first part of the joke is yes this was a bad decision all my friends told me yeah. don't yeah. and yet at no point does she feel bad about it yeah. Yeah, she almost doesn't seem like she needs to justify it. She said, "This yeah. everybody said don't, but I did it anyway. Yeah, and, and it has affected my life in almost no way. Yeah. <laughs> and that becomes the joke is just her, everyone else being weirded out by it and her just being fine with it. I also like the way she describes it because she never seems to be going, and I'm like, and then act something out. It's very much written for the ear. Mm-hmm. This is a very accessible audio album, and as you know matt through mm-hmm. many of the albums we listen to that's not always the case yeah some stand-ups will do a whole one minute bit on something that's clearly physical and you can't even like steve martin like there are parts on yeah. his album you're like i don't know what's happening yeah uh, i always wonder why they leave those into the audio like for the yeah. audio with album. steve martin i think that's a deliberate choice uh, well yes but, we've talked about with, that too. yeah but with just a lot of he's trolling yeah just, he's yeah, just yeah, totally basically. fucking with the people listening to it but yeah. then there's like you know the snl stuff that we did in our last episode you know mm-hmm. where it's like this why did they put this on an album yeah a right. lot of it worked yeah um but some of it definitely would have yeah. benefited but, from some literally chevy's views. nine out of ten of chevy's jokes is him falling <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah the very opening of yeah. the whole thing was a yeah a fall which yeah I think the one purely kind of like the joke you could, I think you can get it totally from context, but she has that joke about um, this getting the spray tan and people noticing the white line under your chin from where you went. And she just makes a noise like, but you can picture her face (laughs) squishing back into her head and creating that line of neck that the spray can't get to. Yeah. Yeah. Like you can picture it. Whereas some comedians would just say, so you know the thing you get here and we're at home yeah. going, uh, nope. Yeah. <laughs> you need that little yeah. bit of description. And yeah, she does it effortlessly. A little bit the uh, the bridal veil made of her own hair. I'm sure she was doing that. Yeah. As she was, was making. Right. But, she, but there was enough language to it as well that it worked yeah. on the album. Yeah. I was and, expecting her to bring up the ring. I immediately pictured the, the girl from the ring who comes out of the TV uh, with, the, with the hair. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so even though this predate, predates Nanette, in a way, I think this is almost would be a perfect post Nanette kind of comedy album because the 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 core thrust of the say term, what Nanette is would you for the, those the Nanette being um, the Netflix special by I am completely spacing Hannah Gatsby, Hannah Gatsby. Gatsby th- thanks um, where she sort of talks about how she was self deprecating in her humor and deconstructs and, and comedy deconstructs as a whole, it really. and like how toxic s- some elements of stand up are especially for people who are at risk or who are, are groups that are looked down on in society where they turn it on themselves to like, oh, I can laugh. You will you be my friend kind of thing. And in a way, this feels like this would almost be the perfect response to that and a healthy constructive, I can still make fun of myself, but in a positive way. I can use my life experiences to then leverage that and get back at the other person who's making those jokes at me or like being mean to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's such a good, that's such an interesting point. Um, that 
it's because it's not like such a direct comparison. But yeah, you could see this coming out in the wake of Nanette and really thinking like, um, because like one of the things Hannah Gadsby says is um, self-deprecating in order to be given permission to talk. Yeah. Um, This idea that until you insult yourself, the audience isn't going to let you say anything. Mm -hmm. And the way that, um, as we've talked about, uh, Beth Selling really doesn't wait for permission to no. say anything. Even when the audience doesn't love it, she just barrels on to the next thing or makes a joke about them not loving it that never seems defensive. It always seems so confident that she loves her joke. Yeah. She thinks it's funny. And um, and yeah, that she never, even if the joke is I did a silly thing like getting a name tattooed on my back, <laughs> she doesn't feel bad about it. Yeah. And and yeah. Um, uh, to go briefly back to the... Um, what came out about her uh, abusive relationship, even even that, and I think this was this album. I might be getting the timeline mixed up. Came out before she'd really come out about that, so she was still being a little um, vague about this relationship. Yeah. Um, and and sort of famously, the person she'd been with, also in comedy, had told her not to talk about it on mm-hmm. stage. And she, the reason she came out about it was because she said, "I." I talk about my life on stage. I want to be able to talk about whatever in my life I want to talk about. And I'm tired of being vague about yeah. this. And probably feeling controlled by this guy, even after the fact, right? Yeah. yeah. Cause she's so usually in control of where she is in relation to the butt of the joke in, um, mm-hmm. in her bits and, and is so in control of how confident versus self, versus deprecated she is and i i can i can see the frustration with not really being able to be in control of sure. that joke and not being allowed to say stuff yeah. about it mm-hmm. um, hitting that wall every time you want to talk about it Just, yeah yeah huh. um yeah i would love to talk about the mom sprint bit yes. go for it let's talk about it <laughs> um well it's such a good closer <laughs> like it's such yeah. a good story and it's also yeah. nothing Sure, yeah. yeah. It's, it's her, longer than I expected it to be, too. It's, it's, it's one of the six, longest six minutes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, six and a half. For how short everything else. Like, the other, I guess, the story about the stepdad is the is yeah. the other kind of longer longer oh. story. But even that kind of happens over the course of, like, mostly one evening. Um, but uh, it's also, like, I think it's it's the story I hear referenced in, in like, with Beth, Beth telling the most. Right. Like, people will say, have you heard the Sprint mom yeah. right. story? Yeah. And I just think that the way she turns, again, what could be a nothing story, it's just her mom trying to guess the <laughs> password for her Sprint account. And it's your every moment in it. It's so, in, like, carefully paced. Mm-hmm. And she keeps heightening without, again, never skewing into ridiculousness. Yeah. Like like the, the tag at the end being her grandmother yeah. going yeah. like i thought this was a real yeah. person yeah. Like, grandmother, <laughs> after all these years <laughs> so much of that frustration with the cell phone company um works in a different way for me than than other um sort of customer service uh stand-up bits i've done because mm-hmm. it's not the stand-up in the situation where it's a confident person telling a story who's like so i was yelling and screaming and going crazy and we're getting mad and yeah 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 but because it's her mom who we've been introduced to we have more empathy towards this character. Mm-hmm. And even though she's making fun of her and we're like, oh, crazy, her mom. We also want her to win. Like We feel bad for her do. mom. Yeah. Sprint and is that, being so mean to her. Yeah, <laughs> and that transforms this story into feeling a little differently than if it was done through like a Lewis Black or someone who's just angry about it, right? Mm-hmm. And we're laughing yeah. at them being angry. We're like, yeah, I'd be angry too. But in this case, we're more empathetic. As we're, la- we're laughing at her, but in a gentle, poor you way. And... I sort of feel like the, I mean, ultimately the point of the, the point of the bit is not even like, oh, Sprint, shitty customer service. Sure, or yeah. The point of the bit, like, I kind of feel like the, <laughs> I feel like the, the sort of the, the, the beautiful sort of main course of that whole bit is just that weird moment where her mom realizes she has no idea who her best friend was. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and it's how so weird to that, that transforms and, into and that. It's just lovely. how weird her mom must have been to like go out behind the garage and just like wait to go to Mary Ellen's house. It's sweet yeah. and sad Nancy, and strange. Nancy, Nancy Allen. Allen. Nancy Allen. Yeah. Which is a perfect name. 
Um, <laughs> it's also and, the name of an actress from the early 1980s. Oh, it was yeah. very confusing for me. Okay, not that Nancy Allen. But <laughs> when you see her do this bit live, she acts out going and sitting <laughs> behind the garage and just like her her mom's like innocent little face just sitting there like <laughs> waiting for Nancy Allen. Like I don't know what she's doing back there, but just like sitting. Having imagination. Having pain. imagination time. And, and, and again, it's something a kid would do. It never strays into the realm of, oh, no child would ever do this. I did weird ass shit like oh. that as a kid, yeah. you know? Yeah. And sorry, my cats are demanding treats. But then the grandmother yeah. finding out so much longer, so much later that it wasn't a real person. Yeah. Yeah. so sad. But yeah, I, I laughed at, I laughed too. It just, it, it turns very quickly from here is who my best friend is to can you just tell me who my like? Is yeah. She, but she. Yeah. It's not that she gave them some information that she can't remember. She, it, it comes across as though Sprint knows who her true best friend is, and, 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 and she that the hint, and she's having an identity. Yeah, yeah and that the hint is think outside the box. Like, what did she say? Yeah, what? <laughs> I need like, to know. We ne- we'll never know who her mom's best yeah. friend is, and yeah, the the like increasing panic in her mom's voice as she throws out more and more like uh, female names. Like, mm. was it Margo? And they're they're <laughs> all, like, from that era, too. Yeah. It was Trudy. Trudy, yeah. Yeah. Trudy Fantastic. Margo, Gail. Gail, yeah. yeah. Um, and just with each one, <laughs> she's becoming more less and less sure about her own life. Exactly, yeah. And it feels like this. it's this weird torture scene we're seeing with Sprint, like, just holding this over her head. But done so subtly, really, just through yeah. her voice acting that, that sold mm. that bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, um... Fun. And the innocent, like also just the the, I mean, going backwards in the bit of it, but setting up how kind of how older people interact with phones, I think, yeah. is so great. Yeah. This idea that um, her mom keeps it inside a quilt bag in a yeah. quilt wrapped in another. That, that was my <laughs> mom, and like, that she yeah. wasn't even sure if she was going to replace it. Yeah, <laughs> like we can't we can't <laughs> relate to that at all. It yeah. reminds me of um, <laughs> the very first digital camera I got when they were a separate thing from your phone. Right. Um, I think I was in like middle school or high school or something. And my parents wouldn't let me take it outside the house. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what am I supposed to <laughs> do pictures with of that? Lots of pics of the cat. It was a lot of pictures of our fish. <laughs> my sister. Throwing up in the tub. Throwing up in the bat. Um <laughs> And yeah, it was all grotesque vomits. <laughs> People burping. And <laughs> <laughs> really like moment to moment documentation of our burping <laughs> competitions. <laughs> but yeah, I was like, they told me that as they gifted it to me on Christmas. And I remember thinking, well, I wouldn't have asked for it if yeah. I knew I couldn't <laughs> take it outside. But that's just like, I feel like the way that people of like the next generation up think about um Technology is right. it's expensive and you need to take care it's, of it. It's breakable, yeah. yeah. Rather than just a thing you use in her everyday life. Mm-hmm. And the way her like they, they accuse her of dropping it. And she's like, I never. I never. <laughs> I know. It's so sweet. I never. But you believe her, she's you so do. careful with you that do. phone. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd love to hear the follow up when this mother gets a like a smartphone. Because I know, like, with my mm. mom now, it's like I'm constantly getting text messages of, like, inspirational cats. Oh. So I'd love to uh. hear the Beth Stelling experience of her mother <laughs> finding her way into the what smartphone happens? world. Well, I also want to know what that we talked about already, but the clue, like, think outside the box. Yeah, that's yeah. so and, cryptic. And what, what she answered and what the real. That's a, that's a gutsy thing for a comedian to throw something out there like that. There's no that, resolution. The, sh- yeah, the shoe never, never drops. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the other thing, I love, and one of you mentioned this just as the album was ending. I think it was you, um, Jason. Thank I you. think it was I pointed to Jason. Um, <laughs> An audio uh, medium. Uh, yes. uh, was it like she has like that great closer of the story of her mom and Sprint? But then the actual end of the album is her just sort of like saying like, hey, I'm kind of sweaty and thank you all for yeah. coming and happy birthday, my friends. And this yeah. was fun. It's yeah. really sweet and it was, and yeah, It was just sort of like this beautiful sort of, yeah, you know, it, I feel like in an old rock album, it would just sort of like slowly fade right. out yeah. as the solo went on. Yeah, yeah. Or well, people these days would almost literally drop a mic yeah. like, I'm out, peace. Like, like, yeah. You know, we both, Grace and I have both seen her live and she has that like i just when i saw her she seemed it was you know she wasn't chummy overly so but she did seem genuinely engaged with the audience in a way i don't think a lot of comedians are mm, um, because cool. there's like this separation 
Well, it's kind of like really I was saying when where she was doing it. Com- a lot of comedians they're putting on this sort of entertain entertainer coat yeah. or like host coat. Like they're not really them. It's a role they're playing, yeah. and then when it's over, they just walk away. Yeah. But she was her through all this. Yeah. Which is kind of yeah. cool. I feel like she built, like, where some comedians build, like, a persona, she sort of, she builds a world instead. Like, she's mm. herself the whole way through. But yet you do feel, right. you don't feel a difference in her earnestness so much when she's is doing thank yous. But you feel like the world of the show has sort of, end, like, this dark yeah. world yeah. she built with her poor, innocent mom plopped into it. Right. Her kids are just saying terrible things. <laughs> like, it, she builds this sort of universe where everyone is just kind of grotesque. But then and she awful. comes back into, okay, we're just having a fun night out, yeah. and thanks for joining it's, us. It's, yeah. it's weird, because it's not it's not the same as, like, uh, one of Mike Birbiglia's sort of one-man shows where it's a story, but right. it does feel like she builds worlds of, like, rules of a universe, yeah. where the rules are generally people aren't going to be super nice in this mm-hmm. universe, but they're also, they're not going to get too bad. I wonder about how she structured this and if originally uh, different bits were in different places. Because I feel like maybe there are some things that we're ready for because we were introduced to that world earlier on. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I, I'm i trying to think of the order of the bits. I feel like she didn't necessarily get heavy, dark or gross later on, really. But yeah, no, I get on board pretty quickly with what she's throwing at us. Yeah, she does more like I think it's the the shorter bits that tend to be get get kind of darker. Yeah. And then, and then it's, it's in and out so you don't dwell on it, right? Yeah. In in a way thinking about it, she kind of reminds me of um Give us John some- Mulaney. Okay. I I'm like my <laughs> god. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, but so but again, it's that completely different tone. Sure. But it's she establishes this is best telling. Like John Mulaney establishes I am a 75 year old man in a 12 year old man's body, even mm-hmm. though I'm like 32. Yeah. So it's like the same, there's, there's, there's a truth in that. And John Mulaney's character on stage, I never question that that's him. Like right. I believe in real life, that is who he is walking around the city of New York and, and Beth Stelling with her material. I never question that this is who she is in her regular mm-hmm. day-to-day actions. Like there, there's no artifice to yeah, her And that's persona. something we talk about from time to time too, is when sometimes uh, you'll find a great writer or performer, but it doesn't always match their quote unquote voice mm-hmm. or, or, or who they are, what they look like, what they are in the world. And when the two things match up, it, it works beautifully, mm-hmm. but it doesn't always. Sometimes people write jokes that they shouldn't be telling. It just doesn't yeah. work out of their mouths somehow. Mm-hmm. But uh but yeah, but yeah, this feels like that marriage. She, it, I was going to say, it feels like she just knowing that this isn't wasn't that far into her career that mm. um, that I it it feels like she found kind of her voice and her her not even persona, because, again, it feels genuine. But she found like I think the the very best comedians know inherently what is funny about them. They know the jokes mm. that only they can tell mm-hmm. and the jokes that they just can't get away with and and right. i feel like she knows inherently what is funny about herself yeah and that yeah. she found that pretty quickly like again yeah there are, yeah. Jo- yeah there are jokes that i don't think would be funny if other people told them and that probably comes I, uh, to some people i think it comes very young i mean when people say you're a funny person i mean i feel like i've seen comedians who are okay that weren't funny people mm-hmm. and like off stage they're just kind of weird jerks and you're like this doesn't match up properly. Like it's, it's way more fun when they're fun people. Right. <laughs> and she seems fun. Yeah. She kind of wrote, there's parts of her. I keep thinking of Maria Bamford in my head, but I feel like Maria Bamford is sort of the negative, like not negative bad, but like the black and white negative. She's like the, yeah. the mirror version of her sort of yeah. thing. Not com- quite opposite, but Maria Bamford We'll talk about dark things in a very su- what, what did we say last time? In a sunny, she's sunny, sunny but dark. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, cheerful, but cheerful also darkness. surreal. Yeah. Like she blows it way up and makes it. Yeah, you know, so cartoony that it's not threatening, but mm-hmm. you can still feel the darkness that in. And and she puts sort of these characters on that are super smiley and mm-hmm. a lot of it seems like a lot of the same type of things, but. A very yeah. different delivery. Yeah, yeah. Exploring the same com- com- comedic space through a different comedic lens, mm-hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, a, a weird, a weird uh, 
uh, may pull that uh, since we're just talking about who people remind people of, <laughs> um, a weird pull that maybe doesn't make sense. Let me see if I can chase this down. She reminded me a lot, not in style at all, but I think you'll see what I mean of Patton Oswalt. Yeah, I, I think there's a I, I think there's an mm. obsession with language. Right. Yeah. She uses it very differently than he does. He's yeah. very Gene Kelly about it. Like he's very like, look at me, look at me, spin yeah. the words, and like you there, know, there's specificity in yeah. both of them, but completely different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Focal points. But like, I I really feel like there was like just some of the wording in this was like yeah. there's. There's an obsession with language that she has yeah. that's way lower key than Pat Oswalt, yeah. but it would, like it reminded me of just like man, she's into words. Yeah. Well, mm. like, like like you know, Grace, you were pointing out like how she says tattoo. Yeah, yeah, like again, and, it's like and DQ Blizzard, Blizzard, yeah, Blizzard, Blizzard, Blizzard was the one I was. It's like <laughs> that was the perfect punch up for that line. It's like it just it made that joke those jokes just a little bit funnier without. It, it, she knows that's not the words, but just saying it in that sort of funny it's cadence, so weird. it just is like the perfect, like, oh, this is where I need to make this this a little bit more silly. And it's yeah. and it's that meticulousness and attention to deta- mm-hmm. details. Detail. 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 Well, it's a it's a thing I, I, I noted about her listening is that she's such a good joke writer. Like there's so many just mm-hmm. like set up punchline, really so good solid, yeah. jokes in this, but also so much um, silliness. That doesn't work for any particular reason, except that it does. Like her mom voice <laughs> is just yeah. silly. Like her her pronouncing words a little bit wrong. It reminded me of um, what everyone says about working with Maya Rudolph. How like she'll start by saying the line like a human would, right. and then by the end, you're, you the words are unrecognizable, but somehow so much funnier. Yeah. She just like adds extra syllables she, to stuff. Yeah, and, there's I forget movie it was. She played a character named Deborah, and she said it was pronounced Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it was from super, uh, not Superstar, the one with um, the Lonely Island guys, Pop Star. Pop Star. Yes. Uh, and and they said, "Oh, what's the origin of that?" Uh, I think Deborah. <laughs> 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 so stupid, but yeah, great. Yeah, and it just adds that little like if that was the only joke, that's not it would right. it would it's never nothing. be enough. But yeah. it's just this little extra, it's just quirk. like weird weirdness. And I also um. As I, I, I kind of compared her to like anxiety comedy, but it's also again this interesting. She's an interesting foil to sort of confessional comedy as well because it's mm. never. Mm. It's also never that she's both right. very like herself. Very, you feel like she's being honest with you, but it's she's not interested in going deep in her soul. It's not like she feels guilty about anything she's done. She recognizes that maybe it's not the best thing someone could do, but I did it. Who cares? And this is what's funny about it. Yeah. It's never. Guys, I gotta tell you something. Mm, yeah, like it, you know. there's never a point where she like gets real about whatever. No, never. And, and that's what makes this so refreshing to me too. It's just it straddles that line between so many types of comedy and just gives you. It's like a like an assortment platter, you know. So yeah. you get get a little bit of confessional here. You get a little bit of a little silliness bit, but there. You never have to deal with any kind of fake emotions. You never have yeah. to deal yeah. with her going. So guys, I feel really bad about this. Like, you know, there's just that BS that comedians feel they have to contextualize their stories with. There's just none of that. It's just stripped away to here's the thing that happened. And the way I will explain it is funny. Yeah. And And that's it. Yeah. It's it's a weird. I keep saying like she doesn't do that. And yes, she does. And yet she does this thing. That's like I I feel like she I don't know. She like there's so many beats that in her jokes that are emotional beats, like just the emotional sound of someone reacting to something mm-hmm. is so frequently the joke of just somebody going like, Ugh, or like <laughs> grimacing or making a sad, like her mo- half of her mom's jokes are funny. Cause you can hear panic in yeah. her voice yeah. or almost yeah. crying. So there's like, she puts so much emotion into stuff, but it's always just like, it's, it's never a thing she spends a long time, like, elucidating how they emotionally felt. It's just in her voice. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, to get that point across so succinctly is, mm-hmm. is what really works, right? Without having to say, and she felt, and blah, yeah, blah, Yeah, she blah. never once says, not describing, it's showing. my mom felt like she was forgetting, you know, how, uh, like, forgetting her childhood or something like that. You yeah. You just hear that yeah. that's what her, we, like, we her mom. We piece that together, and, yeah. Yeah, and um, and the whole fight with her stepdad is like never. You oh, feel man. everyone getting. Oh my! It's so great. God, it's so it's so 
satisfying as a former teenage girl. <laughs> well, this is what's great too is she she re- seems to be able to remember and go through these different lenses. Like she can she can go through the point of view of her now, of her when she was a teenager, of the stepdad, of yeah. all the of her mom, and like you buy into these new perspectives um she's able to to speak through all of them and that yeah. that's really cool there was a there's a great thing with that stepdad story i think the first time i heard it uh when the when i first listened to it i was like i oh i hate this bit huh. i hate this this is like they're so they're so mean to him ah. and, it's, <laughs> and then like listening to it this time i was just sort of like yeah, they were, and she knows that, and she's telling right. the story, yeah. and she's telling it from her, like, she's kind of stayed in, like, the teenager POV exactly. of it, yeah. Yeah. But, but she's obviously allowing for how awful the whole thing was. And, and that, sure. she's, you know. that she sets it up, too, with a, I kind of liked him at first until my sisters told me that, to not like him, <laughs> yeah. and then I like, which is such a sibling <laughs> yeah, dynamic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I'm gonna do what you guys are. And yeah, and then I ended up sort of being, because I think it's like a lot of stuff, like, like uh, my reaction to it was, again, it was kind of my shit. You know, right, like it's right. just sort of like, yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't like that for my own reasons. Like, <laughs> she's just saying what happened. Yeah, well, yeah. I can you know. totally see how. Yeah, like who who you are closer to in that story. Like if sure. if you're an adult man who might possibly marry somebody who has kids, you're like, this is terrifying, <laughs> and this poor man. But if you're like, I I also remember as a teenage girl just these like adult men who were just around and the worst and you were just like <laughs> and like the bit about like him trimming huh. his beard hair and it going oh. into their toothbrushes and uh. where she we she's like we all agree we hate him like we all <laughs> yeah, hate yeah. him right now Instantly. you're like yep I yeah. sure we're on do board. yeah, yeah. And and like it's such a small thing. It's definitely true. Yeah. It's not <laughs> worth getting him divorced over, and yet you do hate him. Yeah. Like, the yeah. second she says that, you're like, yeah, I'm on board with whatever yeah, like, you do to this man. <laughs> totally. Coming from a family of divorce, like, the the, the men drifting in, in and out of life. Like, I, it, it, sir, it, later on, I took off and went to university, and that's when my, my mom met her, her mm-hmm. current husband, who's a wonderful man. Love him dearly. But, like, prior to that, like, the drifting in and out of these guys that are just, like, just go away. You're not, you're yeah. not supposed to be here. And like, they, yeah. they try so hard. Yeah. And just, there's nothing they can do. And and that's sort of like, and it's like that perspective. I'm like, yeah, I, I totally know what's going through her head <laughs> mm-hmm. all the way through that bit. Yeah. It's, it's so relatable. If you, if you have had a stepdad or like my, my dad is, is my, is actually my stepdad. He married my mom when I was four. So at this point I'm so used to him. He's my dad. Like, sure. But I bought in from a pretty young age. But when they first, when I was like four or five, I definitely like he was trying to win me over so hard, and I was such a little shit. Oh. <laughs> he would he would buy me presents that I secretly really did want, but I would just like not play it. <laughs> like or um um he would set up you know the the floor is lava game, and you put couch cushions on the ground, and kids will hop from one to the other. He would set that up for me. It was my favorite game, and I would not play until he gave up and left the room oh, and wow. then he would like peek back in oh. and i would be like <laughs> and i would only call him paul i refuse <laughs> to call him oh, dad <laughs> for so long <laughs> so i like again not old enough to do the sort of shenanigans that that beth and her sisters do in the yeah. story but i related to that like who is this man why is he in our home I did not acquire a stepdad until I was already an adult and living on my own. So no. it's not yeah. quite the same. <laughs> it's not the same as having, again, a stranger in your home who suddenly is telling you what to do. And you're like, mm-hmm. get out or of here. Or trying to be your friend in a yeah. it feels yeah. insincere way. And, um, and like the bit about the religious song that he oh, yes. oh, oh, yeah. It was so perfect. It was, yeah. just, it was like, yeah, this is something that a, you know, a, a you know, a minister in Ohio would mount and his organist would write and they tour Ohio. It's just like my, my grand- And they would think it was edgy. They think it's like, yeah, oh, yeah. this is a deep, like my grandparents lived it's in Ohio and I spent Jesus summers movies. down there and it's just like, <laughs> it's just so Ohio. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, there's, oh, yeah. a, there's an Ohio-ness to this like earnestness of the, the their faith kind of yeah. thing. And let's not forget another perfect joke. In this album, which is that uh, when she says anyone else from Ohio, did you know you can just put all your stuff into a bag and leave? <laughs> it is yeah. so good. But I feel like, again, to go back to how good she is at grotesque characters, 
with the stepdad and with like these little these all these kids in her life she's so good at dropping like two details of it like uh, just yeah. a couple yeah. little details like she that knows what he, you mean yeah that he is weirdly religious and he's slow yeah, yeah. And and she drops in other stuff about how he doesn't have a chin and the whole Ichabod Crane thing, yeah. but like just those like these little details <sighs> that are kind of again like not they're they're so small, but you're you're like yeah I know exactly who this is yeah and he's the worst. She paints that picture so quickly with so few words. It's yeah, yeah it's really great. I I love that line too about. Whatever it is you're supposed to do in the womb to get a chin. I don't know, but he didn't do it. <laughs> That's such a nasty dig. <laughs> it's interesting, too, though, because, like, she kind of did the same thing with her mom, but it's a completely different. Is it a flip on that tone? Because, like, the, the pinata, whereas, yeah. like, the pinata with the throat, like, smashed out oh. kind of thing. And it's like, oh, what kind of person would go and buy a busted ass you know, and then in leave the it morning. in the morning and then leave it out all day for their yeah, dog to freak out at weird. and it's like it's kind of love it's loving it, it's like it's it's, it's, it's the grotesquery but is a love isn't as a loving yeah. way as opposed to oh this guy's freaky kind of yeah, way it's an affectionate yeah. like painting just a very specific portrait yeah and i think for any of us who have aunts and moms and just like no kind of women in their 60s there's all that weird thing of like buying busted stuff because it's on sale yeah. is yeah. such a character trait. Well, and, and i also really like that not quite making that mental connection like if you put the thing away the dog won't bark like the dog's been barking all day like i guess it doesn't bother her it's like oh he's bothered he's barking at the thing but like doesn't yeah, just like, do that second step the mom uh, kind of uh, seems to find it funny. It's like she's like, "What a hilarious day I've had!" <laughs> I'll text my daughter. She likes comedy. <laughs> and the way the mom tries to kind of joke with her and is always like the like like the boner appetite <laughs> joke, where you can tell the mom's being like, "I know your humor. I will participate." I love and yeah. That's, yeah, that's so funny. And then just insults her. Yeah, <laughs> I think you. But, that, but then again, she and turns she it around. It and it's like. But Not it, entirely untrue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> An appetite for bonus. Yeah, it's just, I do. Yeah, but I never finished I never that. finished that. <laughs> that was beautiful. That, that, was, beautiful. Like, that was beautiful. Say, yeah. like, again, it's so densely written, but yeah, you can't even say with one of her jokes without then just going into it's the true, next, yeah. Yeah. next yeah. one. It's true, yeah. Yeah, she's really great at just sort of like floating six tags on the end of each yeah. joke. Yeah. And then suddenly we're just in the next thing, it, and it never feels like, uh, what else have I got here? Uh, oh yeah. So anyway, like yeah. it's just it just flows, and yeah. I just, I can't imagine what that rehearsal must be like. How, like she must have a you, memory, like yeah. Totally, and like it's just sometimes it flows like she just yeah. Again, a tag will start the next joke, but if you when you listen other times, she just starts a new joke. Like she doesn't feel. Mm, I think she's always like seems to be looking for the most efficient way to get to the next punchline, and if it's a, like the um. Again, getting married with her hair as a veil, that bit just starts when you really listen back yeah. to it. She, yeah. what I forget what was right before it, but she's just like, I think if I ever get married, this is what I'll do. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's like really for any, I think a lot of new comedians get really hung up on like writing really nice transitions and making sure things flow. And, yeah. and, and like, she's just like, nah, I just want to get again, into the next Again, if you bit. do it with confidence. People are just listening. It, nothing you say has to relate to the last thing you said. Yeah. If, if you're confident and it's going to be funny and interesting. That, and yeah, she's got that confidence. It's great. Swagger. I think we've talked about every track on the album. <laughs> yeah. We're clearly fans. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Grace, for bringing this to, to my attention. I didn't. I hadn't heard it before. And uh, it's different from anything I've really heard. And uh, I will keep listening. I hope she puts out another one. I don't know. It Me seems too. like her career trajectory may have sort of changed. So I think she's gotten kind of snapped up by TV. Like yeah. she was right. She wrote for another period. She wrote for mm. Crashing. Um, and uh, so, I mean, good for her if she's like getting those TV writing bucks. But oh. I really hope she puts out another album at some yeah, she point. She can write a funny scene. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, we're clearly all fans. So if you didn't listen to it before listening to the podcast, you probably should now. Hopefully we haven't overhyped it. <laughs> oh no! It may not be for everybody, but we certainly liked it. I want to say thank you, of course, to my uh, co-producer Matthew Ardell. Thanks, Matt, thank for you. being here, and of course to Ryan Hughes, who you can find on Twitter intermittently. 
<laughs> Twitter, at, Twitter and Insta. And Insta <laughs> at Ryan F. Hughes. R-Y-A-N-F-H-U-G-H-E-S. Uh, I didn't mention before, he's also in uh, Trash Panda, an improv group with Kat Letwin, and Whiskey Kids, a sketch troupe with Claire Blackwood. They've done a Fringe show, and they've got a short film coming out called Crit, so watch out for that. And, of course, Grace Smith, as I mentioned, is in Generally Hospital, and you can find her... Twitter and Insta at <laughs> at Gracectomy. Yes, because oh, I fucked it up already. No, <laughs> because um, rather than removing me, you're adding me. Please follow me. I need more followers. It's an opposite of an ectomy. <laughs> yeah, delete that last part. It sounded sad. We'll see. <laughs> I'm giving you so much editing. Could have been, <laughs> could have, could have been Grace Otomy. <laughs> uh, now you tell me. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time on Comedy Album Book Club. And that's it. Great. Thanks, Yay, guys. That was fun. You know how to book flights and hotels. All you're missing is a tool to plan the travel experiences you'll have once you arrive. That's why you need Viator. Book guided tours, excursions, and more in one place. There are over 300,000 travel experiences to choose from, so you can find something for everyone. And Viator offers free cancellation and 24-7 customer support for worry-free travel. Download the Viator app now and use code Viator10 for 10% off your first booking in the app. Find travel experiences for you. Do more with Viator. Looks like you need a vacation. Enter the five-hour energy Where Will the Tide Take You sweepstakes. You could win a $10,000 Dream Beach vacation. Imagine jet setting off to a tropical paradise, having fun in the sun, or diving at a gorgeous reef. It's up to you. No purchase necessary. Go to 5hetide.com for official rules and to enter. That's 5hetide.com. Enter today. Ends June 30th, 2024.